All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to our session, Me, the OpenSec Personas. Uh, we have an Easter pass set up uh, with a lovely Bitly link, uh, Bitly slash OpenSec Personas Austin. Um, so we have like some, uh, we have like a link to the presentation included. Uh, also feel free to add any comments or questions um, in the Easter pad. Um, and while you're doing that, let's get started. Um, welcome and welcome to our session. So the session is about the personas around OpenStack. We're talking about the roles uh, model companies uh, around the cloud, uh, cloud ecosystem of OpenStack. Uh, and the goal of this talk is really um, to help us that community understand who our users are and to add clarity when we're having conversations about uh, these users around OpenStack. Um, first, oh, let's see, uh, how should I? Oh yeah, there it is, there's a slide. Uh, yeah, so the presenters. Uh, so we have uh, Buster and Pete over there uh, from Intel. We have uh, Jeff, um, Shamel over there, and myself, Stan, uh, from IBM. Uh, I will also highlight that Pete represents uh, the uh, UX project of OpenStack. He's a project PTL for the UX project, and Shamel represents the uh, OpenStack product working group. And uh, we will also like to dedicate this talk to this presentation to Jim West. Uh, Jim, um, in the middle of this photo, in the center of this photo, typing out his laptop, um, at the time was um, a, a senior architect at HP, and um, he definitely helped us uh, in building that understanding towards operator uh, as a subject matter expert. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks after he uh, participated in the uh, Austin work, uh, Persona work, Workshop last year, he passed away. Um, so we, we wouldn't be able to get this far with the Persona without his help, so we would like to dedicate this pr presentation to him. Um, so, yeah, to get started, um, I would like to talk a little bit about what are personas. A lot of you might have worked with persona before, but just so that we are on the same page. Uh, personas, they a representation of um, your key users. It's usually based on, it's usually based on either qualitative or quantitative or combination of both, based on this research. And as an example on the right, say dog, that's our persona for the domain operator. Um, you can say it's usually depicted as a, a specific person, but it's no, in no way it's a representation of a real person. It's by no means a real person. Um, and um, so by using the personas, it really helps the team to understand and uh, to build on this agreement on who the users are and um, to help them focus, really focus in building, designing um, for specific user, for specific type of user. And you, you might wonder, so, um, okay, I, I'm a developer. I don't really build graphical user interfaces. I work on backend or I'm an operator. I, I don't really care about personas. Well, personas are relevant to you um, if, say, you're a developer, in, uh, for developers in the audience. The persona are really relevant to you regarding to any type of uh, interface, like be it graphical user face, be it CLI, be it uh, the APIs. And on a high level, uh, persona helps you to, 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 to validate like the assumption that you have on what the user would do with your product, um, and uh, really helps you to determine uh, what feature what you need to what you what you need to build and what you don't need to build uh, for your product. And at the detail level, persona helps you determine say the specific roles um, of your product, specific user roles, helps you determine the arrow messages helps you to determine, say, the terminologies or even the default values um, of your product. And for um, the decision makers in the audience, um, they, like um, the, the personal research as well as other research, really helps you to um, understand the cloud adoption strategy will cover the, say, like the cost or the benefits in adopting to cloud. Um, you will also help you to understand how well your company fit into this cloud ecosystem by comparing your company with like other model companies that we have um, from our research. Um, before we jump into specific research findings, I would like to highlight that uh, it's really based on solid user research efforts. Uh, so we had a set of three workshops. We had a persona validation survey. And during these three workshops, we had a set of around a dozen different user research activities 
uh, to help us in building this uh, findings. Um, so we, um, what was it? So we, we did a, a round of like 20 user interviews uh, and analyzed the data during the first workshop at Rackspace. We um, did a car sorting activity with three subject matter experts at the second workshop at IBM Design Studio in Austin. Um, so now I'd like to hand the mic over to Jeff, who's going to talk about like the findings. Okay, so I am going to talk about the um, artifacts that we've created to help the OpenStack community provide more clarity about who users are, how do they differ, um, and what are the ecosystems where they work. And so we have not just personas, but we have the concept of model companies, and we'll, we'll get to that in, in a few minutes. Um, so this is one of the first things that we created, which was it came out of the second meeting in, in Austin. And so this is kind of a set of roles that map to a moderately or larger size cloud environment. Um, and it starts in the middle with what you'd call central IT, or in a managed scenario, that would be the managed host. And then moving outward, you're getting closer and closer to what you might call end users, but hopefully we'll convince you not to call anybody end users by the end. Um, so the red is showing the personas or the roles where we focused on creating personas, and the gray are ones that we acknowledge are important, but we haven't uh, delved into them yet. So we've all. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so in the middle we have uh, data center ops, and then moving outward we have uh, automation engineers, uh, the service admins, so that would be the owners of uh, different, different uh, projects in OpenStack. Um, cloud ops, infrastructure architect. So that's kind of the core. And then as you move outward, you have domain ops, the developers. What's that? Sure. It's the top one. Okay. The um, project owner, and then uh, developers. Okay. And so, what's that? Yeah, so uh, we, we included, we uploaded the presentation and we have a link in the Etherpad, so you can definitely like uh, read through like after the presentation. Yeah. So I think a lot of these may be a little hard to see if that one was. Um, so this is showing the different um, stages of cloud adoption and w we map the roles onto them. And so what you can see is that there are some that are present throughout many of the stages and those are probably OpenStack Summit attendees and then there's a group of them here, which are, you might call the end users, but um, these are the people who have not much investment in OpenStack. They're developers, they use OpenStack because that's what they have available. And if you're not providing them something that's easy to use and that's solid, then they're gonna go to AWS or someplace else. Um, so they really need things that are focused on getting started and shortening their learning curve to get moving on OpenStack. The other ones, they're gonna delve into all the details and learn everything there is to know about it, and they are important, and uh, we want things to be easy for them, but, they're, but they have a lot more tolerance for, uh, for, for pain. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Okay, so this is the OpenStack personas. So these are based on the roles that we showed on the previous slides. And I, I guess I can read through them too. Um, so the, the two at the bottom are who you might call the central IT people or people who would work for a service provider. So there's Arnie, the infra, infrastructure architect, and a Carlos, the cloud ops. So again, those are hopefully representing a lot of the attendees that are here. Um, and then starting up at the top, there's developers and Developers work together, so they need somebody to manage the projects. So there's a, a team lead or a develop, lead developer pay. And so she's really gonna be concerned with, she's gonna be a developer too, but in terms of OpenStack, she's gonna be managing the users, um, possibly managing some policies, things like that. Um, and then there's Doug, so Doug is a domain ops. 
And so you may have that kind of role in an enterprise setting, but you'll definitely have it in a managed provider setting. So that's the person who makes sure their provider is meeting their SLAs, that things are working, that it's running fast enough, and, and so on. And also doing troubleshooting on the, the customer end. So with each of the personas, we have a description. And of course, they have names and job titles, too. Um, but we have a description, and then we have a what does a good day look like and a bad day. And we'll, we'll make those available externally. And uh, if, if they're not readable now, then um, please check them out later. Oh, good. OK. Doug is on the, so the, the easiest way to imagine is to think about it as a, as a hosted relationship where somebody's providing the infrastructure and Doug is, works for the customer. So Doug makes sure that the customer is getting what they expect out of the infrastructure provider. He's a part of the customer but he makes sure the infrastructure is there. So in a, in a large enterprise, it, it would be probably a more informal role um, if they're using domains. But in a service provider type of environment, he, he will definitely be there. Someone has to make sure that the, the provider is providing. Does that make sense? Yes, you would work on the customer side. Actually, the next slide will show that better. Um, so, so that's kind of getting at one of the, the, the key messages is that roles, that IT is complicated, and that there's a lot of different types of business relationships. And so you really need to understand the different types of, of ecosystems. And so what we've provided here, and I, and I don't think this is a complete list, I think, um, Maybe telecom is one that we're missing, and there's probably other ones too. Um, but the idea is to sort of have these personas of companies. So the, the idea of personas is pretty standard in the, in the industry, but this idea is fairly, fairly cutting edge. Um, at least I haven't seen a lot of people presenting things like this. So on the left, we have uh, a research university. So they have a pretty informal setting. They've installed OpenStack. There's, not many rules. They send an email when they need to, when they think they're going to use a lot of capacity. Um, it's, it's not terribly uh, structured the way things work. They're assuming everybody's going to be a good, good, good partner. Um, on the far right is an enterprise, and so an enterprise is going to have much more formal processes. They're going to be very concerned about security. They're going to be very concerned about um, compliance with various kinds of regulations. They're going to have formal, much more formal roles in the ecosystem. And um, then in the middle, we have a service provider relationship. And so the service provider relationship is actually backwards in the title, but the um, MOI would be the customer, and Nuage is a provider. And so they would be providing a service to their customer. Um, Many of the, so they're going to be very concerned about security and keeping their customers um, from seeing each other's data, but many of the other things are going to kind of inherit from their customers. So do they comply with HIPAA or something like that? It would depend on their, who their market is. Um, but then within each of these, they may have different sets of roles, which we haven't created personas for all those. Um, we've kind of just picked one which we think is capturing most of the complexity that you might see in, in all the other ones, too. Um, so we, we really base the personas on a service provider, customer type relationship. Um, as you move to the other ones, you may see some of the roles disappear. So you may see the, you may see Doug, the domain ops guy, not be a formal role in CNBB. Um, in the research context, he, he won't be there at all. There'll be probably an administrator and lots of, uh, lots of users. So then this is showing uh, an example of drilling down into the model company. So these are still in works in progress, but the idea is to show what's important for these different kinds of companies. 
So Nuage is a service provider. They're very concerned with security. They don't want their clients to see each other's data. They don't even want most of their clients to know the other ones are there most of the time. Um, they need high reliability. If they're not there, then their clients are going to go somewhere else. Compliance is going to kind of be inherited from what their customers need. And then I, I, I see a lot of other places that, that could you could fill in here that would be characteristics for these different kinds of uh, different kinds of customers. So now that we have that, I am going to hand it over to Shamil, who maybe we should have warned. <laughs> I was listening. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I I work in the product working group within the OpenStack community, and so just an overview of who we are is we're a group of um, product managers in particular, but technologists, operators, et cetera, that are either building OpenStack-powered products or consuming OpenStack at scale. And so our goal is to identify user stories in the community uh, from operator feedback, from market feedback like telco, enterprise, and, and other verticals, and document them so that way we can all collaborate on the priority of them and, re and resources to get them from you know, concept to reality, more or less. And so naturally, as a part of what we do, the user story is a critical um, artifact that we generate. And in a user story, basically, you have the problem definition, you have you know, what the opportunity or justification is, like why is this problem a problem, and then you have user stories of you know, as a role, I would like to do some capability so that I can achieve some benefit. And so as we document those, when we started the product working group and our user stories, uh, the work being done by the UX team around personas in the community wasn't there yet, so we kind of just randomly chose roles to build. And the result of that was um, very generic roles. So everything became as a company, uh, as a cloud service provider, or as an OpenStack user, or as a app developer. There was not enough context to be able to say, you know, why, why is this role interested in this capability and the benefits? And so one of the things that we're doing now is we're actually going back into our user stories, and this is actually a real example of the capacity management user story that we have, which was before as an OpenStack user, and we're going to go in and replace that with the domain operator because the domain operator is really um, you know, interested in being able to manage the resources his provider is, is giving him or her. And so we're going to go back in and I think you know, with the addition of the personas into the user story, it, it makes the user story kind of be more compelling and, and the context becomes much clearer from that regard. Another way that we're actually using them, and this is actually happening right now, there's, a, there's other members from the product working group who are presenting a cross-project themes update. And so in the product working group, we also like to define as we're capturing requirements and we're also getting, getting um, roadmap information for projects of themes. So basically if a team is working on a capabilities like Cells V2 and Nova, is that for resiliency benefits, manageability, scalability, interoperability, or modularity? And so Cells, by the way, is for scalability. Uh, but as we're doing that, we're now also starting to look at, okay, how can we help prioritize themes and identify themes through roles? And a good example of that is one of the slides that they're showing right now is they have the different personas, and one of the new themes that we're thinking about now is security. And the reason we're thinking about it because security was a theme that regardless of the persona, it, it had impact or, or had um, you know, some interest to that persona. So we kind of looked at themes and said, okay, out of the themes that, are, that we can discuss, which themes would have the broadest impact in the sense of persona. So that was another way we were able to leverage the personas to help make a decision within the community. And so as we move forward, you know, we're looking, we're collaborating heavily with the UX team and we're going to start definitely integrating more and more personas into our work uh, going forward. So it's been very helpful to have it. <laughs> So just to close really quickly, um, we want to talk a little bit about the user experience vision for the uh, personas. And one of the things that we really wanted to do in the community is to build a common language or a vernacular. Um, you know, I want you to take a look at this quote right here. Um, it really boils down to being, 
to having OpenStack act more like a single initiative versus a collection of projects. And this came from the user survey a couple of months ago, and it was a very, very common theme. People, particularly operators, were pushing back on us because they felt that there's so much isolation between the projects and, and lack of coordination that it was becoming uh, confusing for them. And it was small things like the idea that, you know, do you call it a tenant? Do you call it a project? Well, Sorry. what's that? Is that you? Okay, could you stand up for me? I need everybody to turn around. Okay, good, good. So um, what we're trying to do really across projects or pan projects to drive consistency in how we talk about our customers within the community. And that goes from the OpenStack Foundation who we're working with, uh, the user, excuse me, the user committee, product working group, of course, and the open, us, the OpenStack UX, and, and specifically the individual projects as well. Um, and, you know, we're doing that, in fact, we're doing that right now. We're having a meeting in a couple of weeks with a foundation to talk a little bit about their roles. Because as you know, in the survey, you self-identify um, by role. And having that consistency, one of the things it does for us is the qualitative data or quantitative data as well that we generate from the user survey can be, if you will, more easily consumed by the community if we agree on roles. Otherwise, it gets really hard to coordinate. Um, so call to action. So a couple of things. I think the first one is particularly important, which is we really need you to start using or integrating these personas into your discussions as projects, right? So what we're trying to do is, is push the community away from talking about generic users um, because it's so incredibly vague that it borders on meaninglessness um, and start talking about, you know, Start talking about Doug, start talking about Arnie and what Arnie's looking for and what Doug's looking for. And I think in particular, start talking about Arnie in context of the type of company that he works for. Is it a large enterprise? Is he a service provider? Is it a nonprofit? Um, and that way we'll get a little more specificity and a little bit more focus on our, our features. Um, the other thing too is we want you to participate. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. One is we are documenting the personas. Um, we're working closely with the documentation project. Um, as you know, then that's going to go up for review and people can leave feedback. And it would be awesome to have people go in there and leave feedback and talk a little bit about whether they agree or disagree um, and how they'd like to change that. That would be awesome. I think the other thing too is this is going to be a work in progress. And I would imagine that we're probably going to have, I want to say meetings probably twice a year um, with various people to talk about the personas, how do we want to update them, how do we want to make them more useful. Um, and so it would be great to get participation in that as well. Um, the other thing that I do want to mention too is, is important to me is also discussions around the presentation of the personas, right? There's a lot of ways that you can sort of socialize personas and what I want to make sure is that we tailor that socialization or presentation of the personas to the community so it's consumable. Um, so, contributors. One of the things that we did want to emphasize is, you know, this wasn't a couple of people in a room deciding that these are person, you know, that we wanted to have personas in the community. This is actually, you know, a collection of 15, 20 people that participated in it. It was cross company, so we had, you know, IBM, Rackspace, HPE, Intel that were involved among other companies. Um, in addition, we had subject matter experts, we had designers. We had operators, we had product managers as well that were all involved in this process. So it's very, very collaborative. So, have any questions? Wow, you're quiet. Anything at all? I saw calling out names. There we go. I'm, I'm going to let you go. Make sure you go to the microphone too. And I'm going to have you guys come up here with me just to make sure that we can all answer questions. There's a URL there too. And you're also more than welcome to reach out to me if you want to meet me afterwards on the PTL for the OpenStack UX project. So I'll definitely coordinate with you. We had somebody over there. Okay, thank you. As a product manager, I'm very close to personas and thanks for the great job. And I would love to contribute towards the community putting together personas. Uh, question I have is about buyer persona. Did you guys consider it at all so far in, in the context of OpenStack? Is there a new buyer persona evolving? It's, it's, whoops, sorry. It, it, so yeah, one of the things I think that Jeff sort of emphasized is that when we showed the role ecosystem with the levels of abstraction, remember the ellipse, um, 
you know, so we chose to focus on four or five, and it was just sort of us sitting down, trying to identify what we thought was the most important. Um, you know, we may have been wrong, but that's what we wanted to focus on because we had so much time. Now, I think it's, it sounds like a great persona, and, and my recommendation is to reach out to me, Jeff, or somebody else, and talk a little bit about that. And, and the next time we have a work session, we'll bring it up. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a good and idea, though. It's yeah. a great idea. And, and, and I think, too, that they are very related to the different kinds of ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And so they, they really would probably be... It'd be interesting. It, it, yeah. It'd be something we would add to that. And, and same things with uh, other kinds of, uh, like, decision makers. Yeah. And also, and I would add, like, like, the personas that we have, you know, one of the activities we did in the last workshop that I attended was we actually mapped tasks to the different personas that we, we built. Mm -hmm. And so by it, buyer wasn't a persona that we identified, but the element of decision making or influencing was some of the tasks that were associated with some of the personas. So I think when you look at the documentation that's being built, you'll probably find that there might be elements of what would be a buyer persona tr spread across the personas from a task perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to highlight on, uh, like, second on that. So if you look at, like, the cloud adoption stages, like, the first stage is decide. Um, that's, like, the buying decision happens there. The other thing I wanted to add as well is it's, it's sort of an interesting, it's interesting that you brought it up because now you have me really thinking about it, and that's a pretty compelling persona because it does change significantly across the company type. So it's a great suggestion. So Adam Young with Red Hat, and I'm a Keystone Core, and I want to say that this is absolutely fantastic. Um, this is really getting to the heart of some of the questions I've been asking. Yeah. Um, I've been working on, um, on dynamic policy and on roles, as the Keystone is the, um, uh, the role-based access control implementation, which I think is going to be the first consumer of the wisdom that you guys are gathering here. This is exactly the kind of information that we need to feed in. Uh, I'd like to point out some of the other uh, efforts that are going on that are going to be really complimentary. I think are really going to be able to take what you're doing here and, and, and make it practical. Um, one which is, and I'll be talking on this tomorrow, um, on the advances in roles and role-based access control in Keystone, um, specifically the domain-specific roles, which are supposed to be a tool, tool for a domain admin to give their own names. So once you have personas there, you can say this is the set of personas that apply to my domain or my deployment here. Um, but the, uh, the way that you're framing the discussion and the thing that I really like, uh, especially that last thing I just heard about tasks, is I've often thought of this as, a, um, as access, and obviously that's not the entirety of what roles are used for, but um, you identify a person, what they need to be able to do as their top level assigned, call it their role assignment or their, their job assignment, um, a middle tier, which is the workflows. And those are going to be reused across multiple personas, across multiple uh, jobs. And then at the finest grain level, what APIs are actually a they able to call. And to be able to take what you're using there, you're defining there, and drive through a, uh, a diagram and an analysis for a given deployment or, or multiple deployments, um, you're giving us a really good language, I think, to, to talk about this stuff. And so we'll try to consume this and use this as the way to drive what we're doing with, um, with dynamic policy and, and with, with access control. So I just want to say thank you. And I will, I'll tie in with you guys afterwards. Yeah, that's, that's actually a couple of things, actually, that I wanted to address. I think one is we are having, we were planning, actually, to have a meeting with some of the people that are doing the common, common policy roles um, in a couple of weeks. And so it's going to be a meeting with uh, you folks. There's, the foundation is going to be part of that. So they can adjust their survey, and it's going to be us as well. Um, so I'm excited to do that. The other thing that's pretty interesting goes towards tasks is about nine months ago, the foundation actually sent out a survey, and it identified a, like a huge list of tasks and had people select them based on their specific role. And it would be really interesting to do a cluster analysis on that to see how those roles sort of grouped. Because um, I think that's some serious quantitative data that we could use for sure. So you had a question, or did anybody else want to follow up? No. Okay. Awesome. Next question. Okay. So I was wondering whether you have differentiated between the size of the customer, in the sense that uh, whether the customer is a customer like CERN or Yahoo or Bay PayPal, eBay, or the customer is a enterprise customer with uh, you know with a capacity of maybe five to ten racks or something like that. Have you differentiated? Because you know, depending upon the size of the customer, we may not have all the people that you have highlighted. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so I think, so the idea really is that those formal roles emerge more as companies get bigger. And you're, you're totally right. And um, it's sort of an art of balancing having too many different choices and being able to capture the right level of, uh, of uh, variability between all those different roles. Um, so we definitely think about it um, and, and we have to restrain ourselves from creating a lot more of the different kinds of model companies and ecosystems. Um, you know, I think we need some work to, to figure out what works, but we're definitely conscious of that. And I'd like to add on, like, so from not the personas perspective, from the enterprise working group perspective, we also work on publishing, like, materials that can help, you know, people that are new to OpenStack learn what the capabilities are, how to move from, you know, evaluation to deployment. But one of the questions we had in that exactly was, you know, is company size a factor? But we didn't include it because we got into an internal debate about when you say company size, is it the number of employees? Is it the scale of the cloud? Is it the percentage of revenue being allocated to R&D and cloud budget? Like, what is defining size, the budget or the people or the, the scale? So the, the other question I would like to get answerable, I don't even know say that you can answer it yet, is are there, um, are there roles in the organizations that need to be able to do jobs that they can't do because of the structure of OpenStack. That Joe, you know, he's, he's that middle tier, that, that domain operator that you have there. There's things that he doesn't have, he's not able to do because in order to do it, he has to have admin. And the IT and the, and the, the, the people who manage the, the, the physical resources are not comfortable assigning him that, or they have to give him that. And, and in doing so, they, they're identifying that they are violating compliance or they're making something much more powerful available to somebody who only needs a limited thing. Are there places, as we go through, where the, um, the access control, obviously, I think, in, in terms of that, but the abstractions that we have across the board, and it may be on the network level or whatever, don't support the set of roles or the set of personas that we're identifying that people want to be able to have and that they can't because um, of uh, gaps in what we're doing? Um, I, I think we need, well, do you have an answer? No, um, I don't think we have an, I think we need more research in that area. Um, I would bet Doug would probably be the place where that would be the, the biggest problem, though. Because he's sort of, yeah. it, he's sort of a role that might be um, new to a lot, of, a lot of the OpenStack community. And you guys have something like that. It's like an observer, is that right? Somebody who can look but can't yeah, break. It's been a big request. And mm -hmm. that requires modifying policy across yeah. all the projects. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So yep. I, I agree. I think Doug would be the one that probably would hit that. Um, an example of that that I've heard in the past Op Summit was there was uh, an operator who needed to be able to audit the size of all of the cinder volumes that they had across all tenants. Mm -hmm. And they could do it per tenant, but then basically he had to basically run the same command over and over again and aggregate himself because the way the policies were set up, he couldn't traverse and get the full. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I don't know any specific examples like that, but this was, yeah, exactly. This was painful but doable, yeah. if you will. Um, this is not so much a question as an observation. Um, my name is Derek Cadzo. We also work at Red Hat as a content strategist for the documentation group for OpenStack and a few other products. Um, I have done this kind of work before in dearly departed Nortel um, for their documentation. And um, back then when we were still delivering book structures uh, to customers, um, this sort of stuff was very relevant, and especially when you relate it to tasks as opposed to personas, structuring them according to tasks that people would find uh, was useful because, as you say, uh, somebody who does maintenance in one company may not be the same person who does it in another company. Um, but to your question about is the size of the company relevant for documentation, we found that it was quite a bit, and this may still have a bearing in, in this environment as well. Um, for uh, large companies like Bell South, who was a, a customer for us, um, the expertise of the people doing the sort of low-level work and using the documentation was much lower than in a smaller company. 
So in the documentation, we had to include much more detail in the task procedures for them than we would have had uh, in a smaller company, even down to the point where at the end of a command we had to put and press enter. That, you know, that's how detailed they wanted it. So for a larger company, that may be one factor that uh, is, is relevant. And, and you did use organization size, like so the number of employees was out in, in that as a way to judge small, large? Yes, and it's also a question that we're looking at today to see whether the larger companies we're starting to get involved with right now will drive further detail required in the documentational pr uh, procedures. Awesome. I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. Yeah. Thank you. So anybody else? We good? Yeah, I think we're good. So I appreciate your time. It's awesome having you here.